Welcome to healthinsurance.org, another uh, edition of Curbside Consult. I'm, I'm very honored to have uh, Sabrina Corlett with me today to talk about how, um, how it's going. So uh, maybe we should start by uh, telling me a little bit about your day job and how you spend your time uh, on this stuff. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to join you today. Um, I'm a senior research fellow at Georgetown University's Center on Health Insurance Reforms. Um, and at the center, we study how the health insurance marketplace is changing. Um, we've been very busy since the passage of the Affordable Care Act uh, four years ago. Um, and we've been studying how the rules are changing for health insurance companies, um, but with a particular focus on how consumers um, are navigating these changes and how they're affecting them. And, and we focus on what we call the three A's. Um, the first A is access. How are consumers accessing coverage? Mm -hmm. The next is affordability. Um, is that coverage affordable to them? And then the third is um, adequacy. Um, is that coverage adequate to meet their health care needs? Um, and their ability to see a doctor when they need to see a doctor and get preventive care and that kind of thing. So we, everything we do is sort of focused on those three A's. Now, and so uh, how do you think it's going so far? Well, it's certainly going, uh, well, I should just say um, what a difference six months makes. Um, if you had asked me six months ago how things are going, I, I would have been very, very pessimistic. But um, I certainly didn't expect that we would see 8 million people enrolling through the health insurance marketplaces, um, millions more um, accessing new Medicaid benefits, um, millions of young adults staying on their parents' policies. So in terms of just sheer numbers of people getting covered, um, and, and I just recently saw there's an estimate that um, we've reduced the number of insured by about four and a half million people. I'm sorry, um, could so you I think that? just how, by how? that measure alone, um, it's been a success. Can you just repeat that? There was just a sorry. moment of glitch. Uh, how okay. many? Can you just? I just didn't hear what you said. Oh, um, that by just sheer numbers of people gaining coverage and the overall estimated reduction in the number of uninsured, I think this first year has been a success, but we're by no means there yet. Um, we have roughly 48 million people in the country estimated to be uninsured. Um, and if the latest estimates are correct, that we've reduced that by about five and a half million, we, we still have a long way to go. Um, and then ultimately, it's not about insurance coverage per se, right? It's about whether people are healthier, um, whether they're um, productive and able to do what they want to do with their lives and get to see the doctor, and also that um, their coverage provides that important financial protection so that they're not facing big out-of-pocket costs or going into bankruptcy because of medical debt. So. Those, at the end of the day, are the most important metrics, and we just don't know yet um, where, you know, where where we'll end up in terms of the overall health status and um, financial stability of American families. But you, but you do think that the sort of we've moved on from the fairly catastrophic rollout of healthcare.gov, and that people are uh, going to the enrolling successfully and the mechanics of all of that seems to be working the way it's supposed to for the most part? Well, uh, the open enrollment period has closed. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, but I think it closed on a very positive note. Um, for the most part, in most states, um, the systems were working, um, which isn't to say that there's not going to still be some um, disruption for some people. Um, there were a number of people who stayed on uh, policies that um, are not compliant with the Affordable Care Act, and they may need to be coming into the market. So we're not out of the woods yet, um, but I think the open enrollment period closed on a very positive note and um, giving me great hope that um, the markets will stabilize and that people will be happy with the coverage that they've been able to get. You know, one point that Garen's Frank Ruta made, which resonated with me in the poverty work that I do, 
is that a lot of low-income people are used to getting help from systems that don't initially work the way they're supposed to and that that it is you know from the point of view of of uh, sort of University of Chicago professors and Georgetown researchers were used to a level of consumer service from and we look at some of the it, some of the glitches in healthcare that govern we say oh my god you know i can't this is appalling right. if you are used to dealing with any sort of social service context you've seen this tape before and people <laughs> in a sense that, you know there are a lot of people who 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 stuck with it in a sense it's a tribute to the ability of low and modest income people to sort of roll with the punches with a system that's that's trying to help them, but isn't uh, always as efficient or uh, or as seamless as it's supposed to be. Uh, and that's an excellent point. It's it's very much about perspective and what's your use what you're used to. Um, and I think what we did see over the last six months is people coming back, trying again and again and again and again until they got through. Um, and you know, I can only hope that the the process and the system will be a lot smoother um, for them next year. Uh, but got, you got to admire their persistence, that's for sure. So, uh, and again, you're watching healthinsurance.org uh, curbside consult, and I'm Harold Pollack, and I'm talking with Sabrina Corlett about uh, the rollout of ACA's marketplaces and its related issues. Uh, any any uh, surprises to you? Uh, I know that the eight million enrolled was kind of a surprise. Any other things that you're seeing that kind of surprised you compared to what you expected two months ago? Or uh, um, well, we've heard some interesting rumblings from some of the for-profit insurance companies in the last couple of weeks um, that they've been favorably surprised by the number of young people. That signed up in March, uh, or you know, in those last few <laughs> few days, um, uh, which suggests to me that young people um, are procrastinators. <laughs> um, but that they did in fact sign up, and they signed up in greater numbers. Um, and then, then, then perhaps the some of the insurance companies expected that they would. That's a good sign. Um, youth is often a, a proxy for overall health status. So, if to the extent those young people are healthier. Um, than the average population that will help keep prices low over the long term, um, and so that's that was I think some good news that 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 came as a surprise to some. Now, do we know how many people have actually paid their premiums? Ah, that's an excellent question and a question of debate. Um, the insurance companies, in some recent public statements, have said that. The numbers are between about 85 and 95 percent um, have paid their first premium. Um, the House uh, Energy and Commerce Committee Republicans yesterday released a report suggesting that that number is much lower. It's about, I think they said 60 to 65 percent um, have paid. Um, however, I believe that the, that percentage came from a um, an early estimate and wouldn't have reflected the fact that most people have to pay their premium by the first of the month. So it wouldn't have reflected the those premiums that came in right before the first of the month. So is there, do you have a sense of, is there information that you're waiting to see about how the, uh, how things went up until March 31st that, that we should be kind of on the lookout for over the next couple months? Um, well, that, that question of how many did, in fact, pay their premium, um, you know, many probably just paid yesterday. <laughs> um, again, you know, just like we had a big surge of enrollment on that very last day of March 30th, uh, we're probably going to have a big surge of premium payments um, uh, on April 30th, which is the, the final day in which they were due. So that'll be an important thing to watch out for. Um, you know, the other thing that, that we're going to be watching for is just, you know, what kind of coverage did these folks sign up for? Um, you know, what's the age mix? Um, what does it look like on a state by state basis? Um, cause I, I think that there's a tendency to look at, try to look at national information and write a story from that. But the truth is that healthcare is very, very local. Uh, and so the experience of a consumer, the experience of a health plan is really going to depend on what town or city you live in. Uh, it's just a very, very locally driven market. What are some places that seem to be going well at the moment based on what you're seeing? 
Um, well, so <laughs> in some ways, the fact that um, it's been relatively quiet um, in regards to how people are using their coverage, um, in your health businesses, um, in some ways, no news is good news. Uh, I think many people were concerned about the fact that these new plans had narrow networks of providers. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a lot of concern that there would be this big surge of demand and not enough providers to meet that demand. Um, and that may be true in some communities, some areas, but in general, we're not hearing a whole lot of complaints or concerns that people can't get to see a doctor or you know, have to wait months and months to get an appointment. Um, it, it's just been been relatively quiet. Um, so that's good. Um, I think there has been some um, some reports that that people are surprised by the level of cost sharing um, that they face, particularly early on, because a lot of people aren't familiar with insurance concepts like deductibles, co-payments, and that kind of thing. And and particularly if you sign up for one of these lower value plans, like a bronze plan that might have a really high deductible, um, some people are just really taken, they may not um, have had it explained to them exactly what that means. So there's just been some early reports of people being a little surprised um, by that, that cost sharing that they're facing. One of the things that I've heard is that the some of the, there's some Things to be ironed out in the in the no cost sharing preventive services angle, where you show up for a colonoscopy and the yes. colonoscopy is free, but the polyp removal that comes right. with it is expensive, and people right. are right. not expecting that. Right, and the good news is that um, the Obama administration has tried to clarify that so that consumers shouldn't <laughs> shouldn't be hit with a big bill. Um, but the pre preventive services coverage, which is supposed to be free. Um, that's been a very confusing area, not just for consumers, but frankly for doctors and health plans to figure out um, exactly what's covered, what's not covered. If you get an additional service while you're in the doctor's office, what, you know, what are you supposed to pay for and, and what is actually free? And that's just been uh, more difficult than expected to figure that out. There, and again, you're watching Curbside Consult at healthinsurance.org, and I'm talking to Sabrina Corlett uh, about uh, the rollout of, uh, of ACA. Uh, I guess uh, uh, what a couple more questions on that. One is what kinds of plans are people choosing? Are they gravitating to the bronze plans and the really cheap plans? You know, they're not, actually. Um, the vast majority of people... Um, have gravitated to silver level plans, um, which are sort of of middle, um, sort of in the middle in terms of overall generosity of coverage. Um, that's gotten the vast majority of enrollment. Um, and then I think it's kind of even between bronze and gold. Um, and and interestingly, almost nobody has signed up for the catastrophic plans, which uh, have been available as an option. Uh, you know a more affordable option for people. So it suggests to me that um, as people look at their coverage, and particularly when they're eligible for premium tax credits and can get some help paying for the premium, um, that, you know, they want coverage that actually um, covers things <laughs> and doesn't leave them um, with really, really high out-of-pocket costs. Yeah, the silver gives you much better protection against out-of-pocket expenses than the bronze does in various ways. And I don't know it, if that's why it people does. Are it, that. It's it's yes. Um, sorry, I, I missed the last thing you said. Well, I just said that the silver gives better protection uh, against ho very high out of pocket costs than the bronze plans do. Um, well, well, all of the plans um, do provide a, a, a maximum out of pocket cost that any individual would owe. It's about sixty three hundred. Um, per year is mm -hmm. the maximum that you would owe out of pocket. But yes, um, bronze plans do come with higher deductibles and higher cost sharing than silver plans. There, um, uh, but it's interesting that that no one that that the catastrophic plans are getting a low take up because one of the real critiques of ACA is that people should have more options to buy very limited health insurance coverage. And it seems like in the marketplace, that's not what consumers 
are looking to buy. Well, right. Um, I will say, though, that the data that we have on where consumers have rolled in coverage is through um, it's through February. Oh. Um, and we did get a huge surge of people signing up in March, um, including a fair number of young people. So it's possible that especially if those um, last minute signups tended to be healthier Mm -hmm. folks and younger folks, um, that they, it, we may find that in this latest month's data, um, that more people gravitated to those bare, more bare bones plans just because they need less health care than some of the early sign it, sign or uppers. There, um, yeah, that's a, that's a, another thing that we're, another, another known unknown that we're waiting. Right. To, to <laughs> exactly. There, now, one anxiety that a lot of people have is that there's going to be a big increase in premiums uh, next year uh, and a sort of rate shock kind of problem. Uh, do you think that that's likely uh, to, that we're going to see some big premium increases next year? Um, I think this is another one where it's going to be an extremely localized um, issue. Um, and really based on the healthcare market that you're in. Um, and it's it, the, the other problem with trying to predict rates um, is that it just varies. It's, it's just going to um, uh, vary on so many different factors. So obviously it depends on the kind of um, risk pool that exists in, in the market. Um, you know, and so did a lot of health people sign up or as many as the carriers had hoped would sign up did they sign up um, but it also depends on general trends in uh, the underlying prices and costs of medical care um, which has generally been going up year to year mm -hmm. um, and we expect it will continue to go up um, there's also this phenomenon that I think many people didn't expect, which is the existence of these transitional policies, um, where people were allowed to stay on their, their plans that were, um, not compliant with the Affordable Care Act, um, and also, um, outside of the risk pool. And so to the extent that those plans have healthier people enrolling in them, than the general risk pool, it, that could have an impact on premiums. But again, it'll depend state to state and market to market because many states did not allow those transitional policies. Um, and in some states that did allow them, not all insurance companies decided to offer those. So <laughs> it's one of these things, again, another one of these things that's just impossible to make general pronouncements about. Do you think there'll be a point maybe this summer or at some point where we'll have where we'll begin to see the patterns, and there'll be a lot of variation, but we'll, we'll kind of begin to see what what the map looks like. Yeah, I mean, on the premium rates, this is a story that's going to play out over several months. Um, generally speaking, insurance companies have to file um, their proposed rates for 2015 in the next couple of months. In some states, those rates will be made public immediately. But in other states, they'll take one to three months to review them. And, and some insurance departments will push back and say, I'm sorry, this is too high. you got to bring it down. Some won't. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's so we're, we're going to sort of get a steady trickle of rate, news about rates over the next six months. In some states, we may not know what the rates are on the exchanges until the day before open enrollment starts. Mm -hmm. um, it just really is going to vary state to state. There, um, uh, one thing that I was wondering about, some states have pretty significant high-risk pools of various sorts that have to be folded into, or that will be folded into the new exchanges. Uh, is that, it seems to me from a sort of risk pool perspective, you're adding a bunch of really sick people to the pool. Is that going to raise people's premiums in the, uh, in the marketplaces in some states? Right. So, well, first of all, um, this is this is anticipated, um, and the drafters of the ACA included um, provisions to um, what they call mitigate or reduce the impact of this pool of sick people coming into the marketplaces. So, there's a program called a reinsurance program and a risk corridor program that helps protect 
against that sudden influx of sicker people. Um, and, and remember that when they were setting their 2014 rates, which came in lower than projected, insurance companies were expecting to this population. So the 2014 rates were set with an expectation that, that these high-risk pool enrollees would be joining the risk pool. Oh, good. So we've seen whatever the impact is, we've seen th- a lot of it already. I think for the most part, yes. 